Um, this is an interview for the oral history program at the Institute for Latino Studies at the University of Notre Dame, specifically for Letras Latinas, literary program of the Institute. Today is March 30th, 2007. We are at the ILS Annex on Notre Dame Avenue, and my name is Francisco Aragon, and I am interviewing Naomi Ayala. Thank you, Naomi, for participating in our oral history program. Um, would you please state your full name, date of birth, date, date and place of birth? Mm. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Naomi Ayala, and uh, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut in July, on July 8, 1964, and raised in uh, Puerto Rico, predominantly in the Rio Grande area. Oh, okay. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I wasn't sure about where, whether, you, mm -hmm. whether you were born in Puerto Rico or in the U.S., though I did get a sense that you spent some time in Puerto Rico. And in fact, I was recently rereading an interview I did a while back with Victor Hernandez Cruz where I asked him about his, his childhood in Puerto Rico. So I'm going to ask you the same question, but as a prompt, just read you the f four lines from one of your poems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Across from Lucio Beach... A house without walls, womb of moist, rich earth, where I am 13. So I guess, I, I wonder if you can just talk about the context of this poem, El Yunque, the, the context from which the poem arose, and another, another way of asking you about your, your childhood in Puerto Rico, your family there. What, what, what can you share with us? Um, to me, the, the rain forest was a place. We lived just outside of it, right next to it. And our, our little house was surrounded by hills. And you can see the rain forest to one side. And then the line of, uh, faded line of ocean and the horizon from Luquillo Beach, where we got to you know, drive to and, um, and go sometimes. So um, it was another, I'm a water person, and the rainforest was like another wet place. Here's the beach, and here the best of the ocean and the best of the woods for me. And um, the rainforest feels like a cocoon, like it just holds you and surrounds you, and that moisture itself um, feels like it's breathing you, mm -hmm. you know. So to be there surrounded by it, and when you're a child of any age, it's uh, just an amazingly magical place. Dark, really dark, scary, and at the same time very magical. And there's all kinds of uh, fables and myths about creatures of El Junque and things that happen there with the U.S. government and people and aliens coming and all that. So, so what does El Junque exactly place refer of to? Then? El Junque refers to a, sp a specific place. Yeah, it's um, it's actually the one of it's not the highest peak of the island, one of the peaks right smack in the. In mm -hmm. the rainforest. And that's yes. the area where you, grew, where you grew up in? I grew up right next to it. Okay. Yeah. And how far is that from San Juan? Uh, about an hour's time, depending on traffic. Uh -huh. A little less than that, I guess. Now, in the poem, you say, I am 13. So does that mean to say that you spent your first at least 13 years in this area? I was there until I was 15. Um, my family uh, moved. My parents had me and my sister. We were a year and a half apart. Um, when they had her, they moved back to the island. So they came here briefly. They married at 18, came to the U.S. for a honeymoon because my dad's parents were living here, mm -hmm. um, kind of to visit them and just, you know, they thought New Haven, the U.S., you know, they'd spend their honeymoon there. They didn't know what it was like here or anything. And so they were pregnant with both me and my sister, and then we went back where they had three other boys three boys after us. So. so there's five of you? There's there's five of us, yes. Oh, okay. And your sister was the oldest? I'm the oldest. You're the oldest? Yes. Okay. So um, was there any particular reason why they decided to, to go back and not stay in, in New Haven? I think with many Puerto Ricans, I mean, they grew up there. My mother had been out of the country only once prior to that, to uh, Wisconsin very briefly because her brother, her oldest brother, had gone there for work and moved many years before. Um, so she went to visit him briefly when she graduated from high school. 
um, but neither of them had been here. And the winters were hard, and they felt very isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and that separation, we're very patriotic, like everybody else around the world, but when it comes to being separated from the land, mm -hmm. that's a very drastic, it's like the separation from the beloved. And it's on your thoughts all the time. There are songs written about longing for home, longing for the land, longing for the ocean and the palm trees. And so did they... They took you back to Puerto Rico shortly after you were born, or were you in New Haven for a couple of years? Uh, my you? sister had just been born, so I was probably a year and a half. Okay, so you don't really have no more any, than two years. Old. Any memories of, of, of none. Connecticut? None at all. Uh huh. From when I was little, none. Yeah. So even though it's the, even though it's the place where you were literally born, you don't feel a particular connection. No, I mean, my first memory is from when I was three years old, and it was mm -hmm. on the island. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I didn't know I had been born in the U.S. So I only realized that when I was 12 or 13, I think. Yeah. And uh, I literally used to think that it was Puerto Rico and water and water and water. So uh, we didn't really listen to the news very much from, you know, far away. There were news mm -hmm. about the island. And so I, I grew up in this world that that was it. There was just us and water. And uh, when I start, started coming into consciousness about, oh, the world, that, you know, I like to travel and see because how, how could places be so different from the island? You yeah, know, it was yeah. a absolutely foreign concept. My parents told me I wasn't born there, that I was born in the U.S. And I thought blank, blank, blank. I couldn't, I didn't have any mental pictures. I hadn't seen any at school except we, um, like, you know, all children at that time were, um, we had to get up during English class. We were all required to learn English. Mm -hmm. We really did not learn the language enough to speak it in any way, mm -hmm. uh, but to converse a little and to be able to understand a little. But we were required to read the national anthem. So I knew what the U.S. was. I just, besides that, had no frame of reference. Okay, so interesting. So can you talk a little bit about um, your educational experience in Puerto Rico and how it may or may not relate to um, how you, you came to be a poet? I guess I'm wondering, were there any seminal experiences during mm -hmm. those first 15 years that first picked your interest in poetry? Mm -hmm. And a little bit about the relationship between S Spanish and English during those years. Mm. I used to pretend I spoke English. And it was a game that we played, like a schoolyard game. I knew she could speak in, in gibberish to each other. And so it was, there were all these, um, there was all these ideas that if you knew how to speak English, you were uh, smart or of a higher class or something. That, uh, that's what it symbolized. Except for music, there was one radio station that played music in English, and my father, who'd been in the U.S. so briefly, was absolutely in love with Johnny Cash uh -huh. and the Beatles. So there was this influence through music that was present. And we, we had music going in our house day and night all the time. We would go to school half a day. There weren't enough classrooms for kids. And so I, it, I grew up with having half the day to myself while everyone was gone. And that's what I would do all morning long, write lyrics over and over again to memorize the songs, and I would sing them. And so this was my strongest connection to poetry was through the lyric, literally. And Who is memorizing the... dozens of songs I still remember. So you, met, you mentioned Johnny Cash and the Beatles. Any others? Um, Oh, God. I mean, those no, are the that, first two that came to mind. So. Absolutely the first two, because they were, you know, <coughs> my dad was home. You know, he was, uh, uh, he worked at the, what was then the, the international airport in Puerto Rico and was a steward in the Union and got to travel sometimes to the U.S. And I guess that's where he picked up the music, because I'd never seen it. It was an event to go to a record shop when I was little. Yeah. Um, and they would sell the lyrics to all the songs, all the popular songs that were hitting. And there were a dollar, and you bought these booklets, and you flipped through them, a cancionero. And so these were the most amazing things. Never saw them in English, never saw records, you know, from the U.S. or anywhere else there except the ones my dad had. Um, so, your, so your first contact with English in any sort of literary way were song lyrics. Oh, yes. Song lyrics. I thought I knew some. I mean, I knew some of the lines. I couldn't write them down, but I um, just from, 
I walked the line. I walked the line. <laughs> I remember hearing that Johnny Cash line for hundreds of times. Yeah. And then at school, my other connection with poetry was science. Hmm. Um, I had hmm. my English class, of which there was no, not too much literature. Uh, my Spanish class, which was all literature, mm -hmm. and I loved, but I thought that people like us didn't write poetry, that we weren't writers, that mm -hmm. people who went to universities and were from other places around the word, uh, 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 world and were geniuses and incredibly intelligent, they're mm -hmm. the people who wrote, they were the people who wrote books. But were you exposed um, to any poetry in Spanish? In your um, literature class? Yes, I That's don't, cool. I don't, I don't really remember any of it. But Julia de Burgos, my mother had mm -hmm. uh, a book that she received as a present uh, of Julia's when she graduated from high school, and we had very few books around the house. There were prayer books and uh, books of uh, Gustavo Adolfo Becker, mm -hmm. the little um, poemarios, pamphlets that would sell for a dollar, also, and so there were. There were uh, romantic poems, love poems, and so uh, the, some of the very first poems that I wrote around that time were about love or about the island. So you're talking when you were 14, 15? Um, I started when I was 12. Okay. Yeah. Writing in so, Spanish, presumably. In Spanish, yeah. You Only mentioned last Spanish. night over dinner, Ruben Darío, uh -huh. that you, had, you, you became aware. When, when did you become aware of him? Um, I found him by accident in my Spanish class, and I don't remember what book of his it was. This is also in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is also in Puerto mm. Rico, and I didn't own a book. My only book uh, was this tin, tin can where I put, I saved my poems. I would fold them into tiny pieces and throw them inside, because um, oh, I always had gotten this message from home that that was a private experience, like sex. You know, like you just write poems and you put them away. Uh -huh. From the beginning, I got this thing of like, that's something intimate that you do. And I wasn't, after a while, I wasn't allowed to write at home. Mm -hmm. um, my parents, particularly my mother, were, were not very happy about the fact that I was writing. Why not? Um, they thought that, they, they used to say, her in particular, that my poetry was too real, too convincing. That I was writing about love as though, you know, Ooh, I had yeah. been in love. <laughs> I was having a relationship. They were concerned. And that made her a little anxious. So And so uh, what was your response? Did you what was your response? Um, it's the imagination. It's all imagine imagination. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> her thing was the same thing with books. And whenever I did something wrong or got into trouble at school, I used to be harassed a lot by boys. And when I'd go up to my father, my father would say, I don't want to hear about it. You go and you give it right back to them. If you got a gift or something, is that what you're saying? No. To have, uh, they would give me a hard time. They oh. would hit me. And, you know, boys at that age do how they, how they make it known to you that they like you. Yeah. You know? And so they would hit me with rulers sometimes. They would punch me in my arm really hard. I remember a couple of times I, like, actually fell to the floor. And, you know, um, I remember coming up to my dad, and my dad would say, well, you hit them right back. What do you think I'm going to do? Go to school? You hit them right back. And I thought, you know, this idea that my father would save more. So fathers are supposed to show up to school for girls. <laughs> Eradicate it right away. And so I did. But because I did, I got into trouble. Uh -huh. And around that time, it was um, you, teachers were allowed to hit you. And so um, they would have you choose the stick that they would peel down to hit you. Um, to hit you on the calves with. Mm -hmm. And so they had this one called Pika Pika, Itch Itch, and they, they it, would, it, it would just burn. It was so fine and flexible, the wood of the, this tree, that uh, when they peeled it and hit you with mm -hmm. it, it would burn. And so my mother just wouldn't have it. And uh, I was, my punishment was usually, it was a threat. It was like, we'll burn the writing, mm -hmm. we'll mm -hmm. take the books. Mm -hmm. So know, they knew, they, rec behave. they recognized early on that, that for you, writing was something that was very precious to you. Um, yeah, it was the only thing I did in private besides walk. Mm -hmm. I liked walking a lot, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I would just wander. So can you talk a little bit about the transition? I mean, obviously, we're, ha we're having this interview here today in 2007. It's, it's, in, it's in English. Uh, you've published uh, poetry uh, primarily in English, um, though you began writing in Spanish. Can you talk a little bit about for lack of a better term, transition 
where you began to explore writing in English. You mentioned song lyrics as the first contact with English language, quote, poetry. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the first poetry in English you discovered that weren't song lyrics? So just, just take us through that transition where you began to sort of go into the world of English and begin to sort of leave behind Spanish, or at least have English become equal of Spanish. Mm. Um, it was it was coming to the U.S. my first year in the U.S. I had incredible teachers. Um, at that time, we still had bilingual programs. So you came when you were 15, 16? Yes. Okay. So you, when I, high school? Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I was just turning 15 uh, when I started as a sophomore and uh, as a junior, and um, my teachers were incredibly dedicated, and I was having a hard time. Uh, they could tell I loved learning and I loved school, but I wasn't making the connection. And um, in our um, ESL class, English as a Second Language class, we would uh, learn about American culture by trying to understand headlines from newspapers yeah. and captions, and we would read stuff like that. And in English, we were doing Shakespeare. I thought Shakespeare was insane. I thought there's no way I'm ever going to learn um, how to how to speak English and how to read this. I just don't want so much effort to understand anything. And my teacher, James Ramaday, um, decided that he would spend his time, and uh, uh, the head of the, uh, the English department, who was a close friend of his, who would have me the following year, translating with me my poems from Spanish into English. And they thought this would be a great learning experience. It will help her make a connection between the two languages through poetry. And this is literally how I learned English. They spent hours upon hours upon hours doing this after school, before school. So, uh, so let me get this straight. So you, you learned English by translating your Spanish language poems into English? With, well, co-translating okay, that with okay. somebody who, who wow. knew a lot. And I would try to explain to them with the English I knew what the Spanish meant, because neither of them could speak Spanish at all. They did, did, did not understand anything. And somehow, in this, th these were just amazing, amazing teachers, amazing educators. Th 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 this was their idea. And as a team, they did this, and it stuck with me through my <coughs> graduating year in high school. And, you know, all of a sudden, I was like, you know, writing for the literary magazine at school. I became the editor of it. I was so so during that period out. of time when when they were doing this quite interesting singular project with you. Was there a moment when one of them said, "Oh, and by the way, here's Leaves of Grass. Have a look at this." As as your English mm. in read as your reading became more proficient, and since you were working on a poetry project with them. Did any of them ever begin to introduce names to you? I uh, think it, they told <coughs> they told me about. I mean, I remember we had to stick to the curriculum pretty tightly. <laughs> nothing, nothing that comes close to what the reality of sticking to curriculum in. So, what was the poetry curriculum is. for for your age group? <clears throat> well, at that we read time? sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets. Okay. Um, and they tried to connect with me through the humorous one. So eventually I started, they say humor is one of the last things to come in a language, and mm. I really do believe that. Mm. Um, Nothing more contemporary there? Um, no, um, I remember um, getting a couple of poems of E. Cummings, okay. who is one of my absolute favorite poets to this day. And I've read him and reread him and reread him, and he's had a great influence on the poetry that I write that is more playful, and like really experimental in terms of language, yeah. you know. So um, would it be fair to say that E.E. E. Cummings was the first sort of modern poet that you encountered? Mm. Um, in English, that in English? Through school, I mean, no. I mean, I remember that even when I, um, when I went to college, I went to college for a year after I graduated, I met my first poet while I was in college. I was 17. Where did you go to college? Uh, Wheaton College in North Massachusetts. Okay. And um, only when I left college, I realized I wasn't going to be able to afford to stay, and my family couldn't help me. I thought, well, all, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to get myself a job, going to go out there. I can no longer live with the family. I'm going to live alone. Nobody in my family had done this, you know, not mm -hmm. even the men, but women, no. This was very taboo, you know. That if you were leaving home, it meant you were pregnant or you were getting married, and that's it, those two things. 
And so I dis just had this idea out of nowhere. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to read. I'm, I'm, I'm going to prove to myself, I'm going to prove to these people that even though I can't go to school, I don't have to stop learning. So I'm going to read everything. I'm just going to read everything. And I would go. We had a 24-hour bookstore in town. And what so town is this now? In New Haven. <coughs> so um, I would spend my nights there. And sometimes I'd get up at 5 a.m. and bring them coffee, whoever was working that night. And I would just pour through the shelves. And this is how I discovered the Beatniks, T.S. Eliot. Um, I read, I'd read one novel of Virginia Woolf's uh, when I was in college, and then started reading, wrote, read all her letters, um, a good number of her novels, mm -hmm. all her journals, mm -hmm. and, and started developing these fascination threads, you know, in literature. And so that this I was when you were in your around. early twenties. Um, yeah, I, I was eighteen, nineteen. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so your education in that sense was this twenty-four hour bookstore. That was your library. Yes, and well, the local library too. Although I, I, for some reason, tended to use them more for music, as mm -hmm. they, uh, mm -hmm. I discovered classical music mm -hmm. while I was in in college too. And mm -hmm. my concept of classical music wasn't like yeah. Chopin, who's you know. Mozart so, so you've mentioned the E. Cummings. Uh, do you do you recall at what point you became aware of, of some of the other modernists, oh. like, um, well, you mentioned T. S. Eliot. Mm -hmm. Any any other of his contemporaries? No, no. I mean, because I had basically, it, it wouldn't be till later, I didn't have that I'd become friends with professors who'd say, oh, you're a writer. I heard you read at such and such a place. What do you do? Why are you, how are you here? That I'd strike those friendships and they'd tell me about literature from their perspective. So I had all these different types of friends mm -hmm. that together would add a little bit more to who I was becoming and mm -hmm. in terms of learning. Mm -hmm. You know, what I was learning was out there in the world, but in, in literature, uh, I mean, one of the ideas behind my mind uh, when I thought I'd get an MFA was that maybe I could put all this together in my brain, all these different experiences of reading throughout my life, you know, from being a young woman to being an adult to coming of age, of reading randomly, maybe randomly, not necessarily. Well, one, um, one thing I have noticed though, of, the, of the authors that you've mentioned thus far, and this will lead to my next question, um, do you recall who was the first female poet in English that just sort of jarred you and opened your eyes to another world? I mean, you, meant you, you started with Johnny Cash and the Beatles, <laughs> and then you went to Shakespeare, and then you went to T.S. Eliot and the E. Cummings. Who was the first female poet uh, that all of a sudden turned a new page for you? I remember uh, Nikki Giovanni, Black, 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 the book, Black, 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 and I had already started teaching high school. Um, so, this would have, so this would have been around when, Nikki Giovanni? When I you, was 20. I see, I started teaching high school when I was 21. Okay. Yeah. So in your memory then, Nikki Giovanni, when you were 21, was, was among the first female poet. That and Osaka Shange. Okay. I thought they were just, I, I, I mean, I cannot describe. I thought, you can do this? You can write like this? It's okay to write like you speak? It's all right to be pissed off and say so? It's all right to tell your truth? To be, so it made to me so where the, the, the symbols of female griotism. So which volume, thought, which volume of Nishaki uh, Shange, which one, the, which, which oh, one, the one about, oh, um, has rainbows in the title, isn't it, right? I, I think, I think that's right. Um, and then he, who was it who wrote, uh, around that time I saw a special, a dance performance of when colored girls uh, that's consider suicide that's Nishaki Shange. when the rainbow is seen off. That's her. Uh, what is the full title oh, of that? You're, yes. When the yeah, something along, yeah, something but that's, along that's, those yeah. lines, and I thought, oh, here <clears> we go. And I thought, oh, I've discovered a poetry. I like this stuff with language. I like this stuff with academe and intelligence, and it challenges me. And it's not that this stuff lacks it, but this stuff is earthy. It's raw. It's like sweat and musk and something organic and, and breathing, and it just mm -hmm. felt like closer to me. So and when did you begin writing the poems that would eventually uh, end up in your first book? When did those poems start to get written? Um, I mean, I wrote very consistently all throughout. I think probably my early to mid-20s. Uh, 
probably early 20s, I worked on some poems for years. And mm -hmm. I remember there are poems in that book that I worked on for three or four years. And uh, Okay. Um, That's a wonderful comment because that leads into sort of the next area that I'd like you to, to share with us. You, you, just meant, you just said something that I, that I particularly identify with, mm. and that is to say, I worked on some of those poems for years. Can you share with us a little bit about, well, first of all, that comment. I mean, someone, someone perhaps who's not familiar with poetry, to hear someone say, I, I worked on that poem for years, mm. what does that mean? So can you talk a little bit about your process mm. and, and just unpack a little bit that phrase of some of those poems I worked on for years, um, <clears throat> which implies m several drafts, I imagine. Yeah, I, I'm always surprised to meet writers or aspiring writers who say, oh, you know, I believe a writer writes, but I believe a writer revises and edits and grows and feeds herself or himself. Um, and to me, this is all part of that process. So. Um, Sometimes I notice this as I've been writing for so long that over the years I'll be following something subconsciously and I can almost taste it consciously, but I can't. And, and part of my job is to intuitively remain connected to that and to uh, follow it unquestioningly. And sometimes I'll be ahead, my poetry will be ahead of me. Mm -hmm. It will be ahead of my growth, ahead of my ability. And I've noticed this for years and I'll slowly catch up. Um, and I won't stop what it is I'm following, but I realize that at that moment, in terms of what I'm trying to do, my skills uh, or my seeing as a writer is not matching what's showing up in my brain that I want mm. to create, that I want okay. to make happen. And in my brain, it's realized, but out here, it's not realized. So there's this process of translation, of channeling this stuff, and so working on poems you know, I can look at something and say, God, you know, I'm so dissatisfied with this. Míralo. And, and put it aside. And I noticed that I always had this, this commitment to go back and to look because what I could not appreciate now, I may appreciate later because some of those poems were ahead of me. And mm -hmm. I never knew which ones they would be. Mm -hmm. I also have always, always, always believe, believed because I, I learned by doing in my life mm -hmm. that every poem comes to you to teach you something. Mm -hmm. And if you're open, if you look, it'll be there, you know. Um, now, now, so, If I'm hearing you correctly about your technique as far as how a poem evolves, you, 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 write, you might write a first draft and even a second and a third draft in, in the first arc. And then you get to a point where you can't take it any longer. So then you set it aside and a period of time might go by where you gain more experience, more insight. You go back, and then you feel like you're now capable to take that draft to the next level. Is that, is that, is that a fair? Yeah, and it's not just in the writing. It's in the <coughs> visioning and the conceptualizing. Mm -hmm. And I think more than anything, conceptualizing. There's, there's a poem in, in my book, Wild Animals on the Moon, I think it's, 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 it's called A Man Will Rush From Behind Me. Mm -hmm. That's that in the poem, beginning of the book, yeah. Yeah, it took me three and a half years of working on it regularly. What do you Why? mean by regularly? Regularly, it used to be 12 pages long, then mm -hmm. seven, mm -hmm. then three, then it, it, it was boiled down to that because it was, um, it was, it was a poem about, and, and people have asked me this before, and they say, oh, it's because it's a rape poem, isn't it? And that must have been very difficult to write. And I always say, no. I mean, there's, there's, there's something about that, on one hand, it's difficult about writing about some experiences yeah. when you also want to capture them. But you don't want to just be a historian. Yeah. You want to transcend them. Yeah, yeah. And you want to be expansive with them. So that's a little challenge on the side. But the other challenge is how to be a craftsperson within the context of whatever. Because if you're a writer, it doesn't matter what your material is. You're a craftsperson. It's an art. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an art and a science. Where, so, where, where um, was that instilled in you? Because I, um, so you've talked about wonderful teachers in high school. What this this work ethic that you have on really mm -hmm. being attentive to the craft and mm -hmm. you know rising to the occasion on the craft. And if it means putting a poem in a drawer for three years, then you do it. Where did that come from? Did, who taught you that? Is that something you just discovered on your own? Or did you have teachers who talked about their experience? And 
Nobody ever asked me that. That's a good question. Um, no, people didn't care. I mean, people cared, but you know, they had lives and because it sounds like it's, it sounds like it's a position me. that you really you sort of hearing you talk about it and hearing how you talk about it. It sounds like it's something you sort of evolved into. I, I mean, I imagine when you were writing your poems when you were fifteen, you weren't you didn't have this depth of consciousness about keeping a poem in a drawer for a long time and coming back. What? No, I just checked them every day. I just had to make sure that they existed. Mm -hmm. See, for me, also, writing was an act of becoming visible. I felt a lot of the invisibility around me. In one sense, when I was on the island as, as a young woman, you know, when I came to the U.S., it was as a woman and as a Puerto Rican woman. So I always associated that with, like, oh, I am here, I'm real. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one connection. And in terms of work, um, from my family, I come from a working class family, um, and, and everybody works, and I have a lot of respect for people who work on the land and who work with their bodies. And, you know, okay. no matter what, you have to get up and you have to show up, and if that's your work, there's a dignity about it. If it's sweeping the floor, you get up and you sweep the floor and you sing as you sweep that floor. Okay. On that note, I'd like you to read us a poem okay. and tell us about it. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Hole. One morning they dig up the sidewalk and leave. No sign of the truck, only the large, dark shadow digging and digging, piling up sludge with a hand shovel beside the only tree. Two o'clock I come by and he's slumbering in the grass beside rat holes. Three and he's stretched across a jagged stone wall, folded hands tucked beneath one ear. A beautiful young boy smiling, not the heavy, large shadow who can't breathe. Four thirty and the August heat takes one down here. He's pulled up an elbow joint some three feet round. At seven I head home for the night past the fresh gravel mound, a soft footprint near the manhole, like the ex Abuelo would place beside his name all the years he couldn't write. Talk to us about that poem. That the ending is startling. Those last two lines just mm. come out of nowhere. Um, I mean, I, I watched this man all day outside my window and coming in and out of my apartment. and. Uh, uh, he made an impression. I love to watch people work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, it inspires me. It, it, uh, it motivates me to write. It reminds me. It affirms me. You know? How did your grandfather and end in it, get, get inserted at the end? Because I was thinking when I was watching this man, I thought all oh, that there is a trace of him in this world. I was thinking about writing books. And my grandparents, my maternal grandparents were illiterate. And so it was my, my job when I was little, my job of love, to read and write letters for my grandfather and to mm -hmm. read the Bible mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was about the only book we read at his house. But um, how it was ironic that, you know, here I am, a writer, and, uh, and I saw this man working outside, and my grandfather worked really, really hard all his life till he died in his late 90s. And uh, Who was his name? I thought, Juan, Juan. Mm -hmm. uh, Juan Lopez. And I thought, oh, this is like a signature. I thought, here is this man. This is the only trace is his footprint near this manhole. His work is done. He's gone. Nobody will know that he did this. Yet, you know, this is a part of our life. That's his job. It's important. It makes some of everything happen. And there are so many people like that who make so many things happen that we don't really see. They're invisible to all of us. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's his signature. And it had to do with illiteracy to me, which I associated with invisibility. You don't count. So in those days, even the deed to his house, he had to sign with an X. And I thought it always stuck with me, like you have to sign with an X, and you vote with an X, and you have to, what is it, the X? And at the same time, the X is like crossed over, no, rejected, gone. So, and this is your signature, and mm -hmm. nobody sees it, but it is a signature. Yeah, I mean, you've been there. And, um, and is that poem whole? Is, is that a poem that took, you, we've been talking about poems that take a long time to write. Is that one of them, or is that one? No, that's a, a, 
that wasn't a response to a quick to a stimulus. I mean, it mm. was in my mind. I just observed him pretty much all day long, and I wrote it in maybe ten minutes. So, for the record, then, your 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 poems, they they each have their own life. Some might take a long yeah. time to write. Some might not take a long time to write. Yeah. Okay. On average, now, unless I'm really really being challenged by something. And right now, my challenges always lie in suites or series of poems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not in one particular poem. I mm -hmm. think of things as being more connected and expanding mm -hmm. sideways. Yeah. And so those are the things that challenge me the most. But I'll sit down and, on average, a poem that is feels like layered to me, um, that's more indirect and more difficult to write, will take me five, six hours. I'll sit down and not get up. And I'll do uh, the first draft, second, third, right on the same really? pages that I've written it on by mm -hmm. hand. So it'll be an average of four to six hours. So you write, you write your, your drafts in longhand? Always. In All the, uh, Poetry I do. Yeah. Always. Yeah. It's very rare that I don't. <clears throat> do you have a writing routine? I know this is sort of the, 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 everyone asks writers these questions. Do you have a writing routine? Do you try to write mm -hmm. where poetry is concerned? Uh, do you try to write, write, write every day, or do you just wait for inspiration? What, what? Yeah. I used to wait for inspiration, but I wrote every day till I was 30, every single day, more than one or two pieces. Mm -hmm. If I wrote two, it was kind of low. One made me nervous. I thought I was going through something. Yeah. Um, so um, it was uh, after that, it was impulsive, which is the nature of m most of... Uh, the writing that poets do, and at the same time, I started reading books on writing by fiction writers, and mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute, these people are geniuses about how they, you know, their lives, their writing lives cannot work unless they plan, they calculate, they think, they show up, and I started reading around that time, writing by writers on writing, and uh, it made me think a lot, and I thought, you know, I am, I'm, I'm not going to limit myself. I'm going to try and show up, mm -hmm. so I could do a writing-related activity. Um, whether it's write about writing, write about writing, mm -hmm. or write poetry, and it's all in my mind, it's stimulating me in the same way. Um, it usually depends on what's going on in my life, what kind of work I'm doing for yeah. a living. Yeah. Um, but not, Saturdays yeah. are my favorite day to write. Yeah. Saturdays where I can say, if I want to write for 10 hours, I can write for 10 hours. I don't have to answer to anybody. Mm -hmm. you know? I want to get back a little bit to, before we, I ask you to read another poem, I want to get back again, to this idea of writers who have been important to you. So before, I, I, I pointed out to you that all the writers you had mentioned up to a certain point were all male, and I said, what about female writers? And you mentioned um, you mentioned Nikki Giovanni, and how do you pronounce her name? Nishoki Shang? Nosaki Shang. No, Nosaki yeah. Shang, okay. Two African-American uh -huh. uh, poets. So now the next logical question is, I think, can you recall or t about the first Latino or Latina Puerto Rican poet mm -hmm. that sort of what? Julia de Burgos. Okay. When I was in Puerto Rico, you know, that, that, that was it. And I wouldn't meet <coughs> her work again until much later in my life. Mm -hmm. I was also, when I came to the U.S., it was rare to see poems here and there in literary journals by Latino writers. And so when I discovered writing by black women and men, I remember thinking, this is, these people are alive. And then later on, I would meet like Adrian Rich and people like that. Um, but I thought that our poets, our writers that people talked about were dead. And so in, the case in of my Julie, mind- In the case of Julia de Burgos, that was the case, right? And that was the case. Yeah, yeah. And in my mind, I was writing, and s somehow I'd made a connection between, I want to read people who are working like me right now. Where are they? There's got to be more. So who was Where the first, are they? So who was the first you came in contact with? A Latino writer, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Martin Espada. Tell uh, me how you f discovered his work. Um, I, I met my publisher when I was 18 years old and, and would volunteer for a lot of their book festivals and would spend weekends at his house. They, they used to have... Um, these get-togethers with writers, political writers from all so, over the so country. So just for the record, you're talking about Curbstone, Curbstone Press, Press and Sandy Taylor. And Sandy Taylor. Okay. And um, Sandy would have these great parties. We would drink beer and talk politics and poetry till 5 o'clock in the morning and, and do it again for an entire weekend. 
with people like Jack Hirschman from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, so many notables. Um, that's how I met Claribel Alegría. And I started, I mean, Sandy Taylor was the person who introduced me to Martina Espada and introduced me to a lot of the writers that would influence me that I felt were my contemporaries because they were alive at the yeah. time I was. And I thought, oh yes, literature is alive. Poetry is alive. And it's not only the university people doing writing, it's out there. People are doing this in different styles, like different clothes they wear, different so songs they So when you met Martina Espada, he wasn't yet because I know now he had he, just written his first book, now, the Puerto Rican Ice Boys Bolero, and that was um, published by by because I know Bilingual uh, did one of his books. Bilingual yeah, did his I second book. I don't remember who that was. It was a while back. I guess my question yeah. is: When you met Martin Espada, was he still outside of academia at that point? Because I know now he teaches. You know, he's an he English was, professor. He was a tenant lawyer yeah. at that time. Okay, so you met him yeah. when he was still a tenant lawyer. Yes. Okay, yeah. so you, Martin Espada through the connection through Sandy Taylor. Anyone else? Um, what about Lat Latino writers that you may have, may have met through through their through their work, but not necessarily, you know? Oh, in person and through their work, Daisy Zamora, Giacomo Belli, um, Jack Agueros, who for me um, has always represented from the time I met him until this day an embodiment of the my eclectic reading taste, you know, that I accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. He's got that sheer intelligence, that curiosity of a scientist to take apart how something works, you know, enough to write uh, the most incredible story you could ever read about a clockmaker in his daily life. And, and, and Jack also, I don't know if he's ever spoken about this, but Jack, Jack um, put, sheds light on the life of work and what that means, the things that people do and how that's a part of the fabric of life for those of us who don't even participate in, in life in general mm -hmm. in that way. Um, so he's always, and he writes sonnets. He's, yeah. He writes incredible sonnets. <coughs> he's got a book of sonnets, right? He's got a, a book of uh, psalms, you know. Mm -hmm. So he's got, uh, he's somebody, again, that was influenced, and um, this makes sense with his, um, you know, Do you remember how you met him? What the background. circumstances of meeting him was? Uh, God, it was so long ago. No, but it, it must have been through Kerbson or through Martin, because Martin... Um, Martin's father, Frank Espada, the, the, the renowned photographer, and Jack, who mm -hmm. must be now in almost 70, yeah. um, were all-time college buddies. So, um, and yes, I met Jack because Martin used to always tell me about Jack. Martin was from the time he met me after me to publish a book, publish a book. Look at all this stuff you have. You write all the time. Have you, take, have you thought about this? And I thought, no, I send stuff to journals. And, Hopefully, you know, they'll publish some. And, and he'd done the same for Jack. He had gone to Jack's house one time, got sick of telling him to please think about publishing a book. Put together, took the poem, stole them from his house, put together a manuscript, submitted it, it was accepted. And this is how Jack Aguero started publishing. Who, is, who, is it, who, who did it? Martin did no, this. Which publisher? Oh, I don't remember. It may have even been Curbstone. Curbstone. Okay. And, you know, like seven well, books later, well, this, 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 this writer, brings, nobody this, would ever have found out This brings me to another question, which I always mm. find a fascinating one for people, who, for poets who, who, who publish books. And that is, um, talk, talk, us, talk to us about that process of putting together that first manuscript. Did you do that with friends? How, you know, talk to us about shaping that manuscript. I absolutely hated it. I hated the process. I thought, I am never going to put together another book again, <laughs> never in my entire life. Um, because I'd been writing for so long, and I thought of poems as individual units. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had never had that experience and for so long, and now we're talking like I'm doing this at 25, 26, I'm putting together this book. So I just saw the individual thing. I couldn't connect the pieces, and uh, I had tried and sent them out to a few friends, some friends who were college professors, other friends who were avid readers. and. Everybody, of course, disagreed about the order in which they should go, about which poems should be in, about which lines should be revised, and I thought, I, I can't do it, it's too schizophrenic. And so Jack and I had become much closer friends, and he said he was living where he still is in Manhattan, and he said, why don't you come over? I'll, he's an incredible cook. I'll cook for you and take you out when you finish for an entire weekend, three days, 
and your job is just to lock yourself up in my living room. You can have every flat surface, including the floor, spread out. But by Sunday afternoon, we're going to dinner with a friend, and we're going to go see a movie, so you have to be done. And you cannot come out until you're done. So you're going to have to figure it out. Would you come? And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? That's as good a plan as I any, because I have to have this done. It's mm. like, and the moment you finish it, we'll walk right to the, you know, I've got a packet for you waiting, and we'll go right to the mailbox at the post office and mail it. So that weekend, I mailed my <laughs> script to from, from Manhattan to Curbstone, yes. And a couple of months later, they, they took it. So. How did you come to an order for the second book, the one that's at Curbstone now? Similar, um, similar situation? <laughs> no, this one felt more, I thought of it in, in parts. I mean, some of the criticism and, and the reviews I received from my first book was that the way it was divided, that there's no logic to it and all that. And I thought, God, I just ma I'm glad I made it. But for this one, I thought, I thought differently. I mean, it's a poem, the poems are very, very different from my first book. And so I have some you know, women coming of age poems and um, then uh, poems about the natural world mm -hmm. and some that are celebratory and others that are darker and others that are more, you know, um, Did you get help for that Surrealistic. As well? Did you get help to help you order that book? or? Um, I got some suggestions. I basically, you know, ordered a run. I have a friend who also ha has helped me mm -hmm. go over. I'm still, it's still in process. I'm turning in mm -hmm. uh, my, my final electronic copy in a while. So, but I feel at peace with it. I divided it using uh, quotes from some poems that were particularly significant mm -hmm. for me about what so you, they meant. You mentioned you feel at peace with it. <clears throat> As you know, we're now work you and I are going to be working on on a manuscript for bilingual press, and so you submitted it. We, we, we have a contract with bilingual, so we're going to work on it. How do you feel? And you can be. How do you feel about uh, that manuscript and its current state? Do you, do you think that? What do you think? I I think that it's a a, a manuscript that I'm going to enjoy working on very much because. Um, it's, it's good. It's, it feels like a creative project already, um, whereas neither my first nor my second book felt, felt mm -hmm. like that at all. It feels like I get to play, I, like, I get to mold. Somebody says, mm. oh, you're here, you know, you put together these pieces. I'll bring them back and you can make something else with them or you can reshuffle them around. It feels more... Um, Playful to me. It feels so you definitely, like a different you, you definitely view, view this as a work in progress at this stage, right now. At this stage, <coughs> yes, of molding and shaping and discovering, mm -hmm. and I think it's what, how it presents itself to me is a, a tool uh, to get to know myself in a different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Something I have been and I am, but I've never had a, a formal opportunity to look there. And Great. to see what's in there, now, apart from these other literary selves. Now, as you know, uh, one of the things I've mentioned to you is, is, the, is the, the possibility, and this will be a, a segue into my next question, the possibility of, of coming up with a Spanish version for, for every poem, or for the poems that we end up choosing. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship now to the Spanish language and how that has evolved over the years as a poet who now writes, I think, if, I don't want to assume anything, mm -hmm. as a poet who now writes primarily in English, but who still retains uh, Spanish. Talk, can you men talk about that? I, um, I write regularly in Spanish. Okay. Um, I have poems in Spanish everywhere. I think my greatest challenge as a poet was because I came at the age I came. To me, Retaining my first language was my first political act in this world. And that's exactly how I thought of it at 15 and 16. I vow never to lose my language. Nobody will take this from me. Um, and that was significant because it was my, what I had, what I had were, I'd, I'd migrated to. That was my identity, was that. It was what connected me to that. And, you know, Spanish is uh, a romance language. It's incredibly lyrical. It's lyrical by nature. 
and it's a sensuous language by nature. So all the things that I know of poetry, that I know of, of sensuality, of being in the world with the senses, is through my first language. I can never lose that. Do you have I mean, any... it influences what I write in English as well, even though my writing in Spanish is incredibly different from English. Do you have any ambivalence um, about writing in English at all? Ambivalence in what respect? Well, that it's the colonizer's language, you know. The... No, um, I, di I did at the very beginning. I did my first year. And I thought uh, when I discovered racism and prejudice and I was just not emotionally equipped to be able to, to deal with people hating me without my having done anything. This, this was a revolutionary concept for me as a teenager. I mean, I had just not experienced that in my life at all until then. Um, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to show these people. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to publish it by the time I'm 25. And, and it's going to be in English and it's going to be really, really good. And I am not going to ever, ever stop writing in Spanish because my book in Spanish is coming along sometime. So um, this was part of, of uh, I don't know, it was, I, didn't, I didn't have the tools to be able to, to deal with coming to terms with mm -hmm. that, but it was it was a lifeline that mm -hmm. I kind of threw out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in order to survive this, you know, I'm going to be able, I'm going to need to be able to hold on to something. What's it going to be? Well, I have this. You know, I can create that. Okay. So. You mentioned retaining your Spanish was your first political act. On that mm -hmm. note, I'd like you to read this poem, the poem within me, and tell me about it. War begins right here on my street. It begins with me. I see her weapons in the eyes of a child, her face on window panes. There are times I want war. I lie down with her. I stroke her back. There are times she enters my house, and I enter into battle with her. War slips in into my name. I have her in my blood. She sweetens my morning coffee on Saturdays. I betray her. I hide from her, run away. But already war knows the course of my dreams, wants to steal the children of my soul. War begins with me. It is with me that war begins right here on my street, in the small showers of bullets in an empty garbage can, in what I say and do not say, in the bewitching ivy of tedium, in the soap I used to bathe. She is in my fingers, in the shadow of my eyes, in my lover's hair. I sing to her so that she may leave, so that war leaves me. Today I sing to her, and she lets me sing. Thank you. Tell us about that poem. <laughs> I mean, it's, I imagine someone hearing you read that poem today, March 2007, the first thing someone might think, when did you write it? Does it have anything to do with the current world situation? Yes. I'm just curious. Yes, it does. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote it, it's, it's maybe a year and a half, two years old. Uh, maybe it's a little bit older. When the war in Iraq started around the time, and I was thinking how, how, you know, only, only in the U.S., it seems, and now not as much because we have this war going on uh, like we did in Vietnam where people seem to be separated from the idea of war so much. It's not in the fabric of their lives. It doesn't affect how you get your food. It doesn't affect uh, the clothing you wear, where you get to live as much. So the impact on, on people, their awareness of it, they could be remote from it. And I think that that changed just before this war was September 11th. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I was, it was a time that was very interesting politically all around the country, as, as many people will say, and particularly living in D.C. Mm -hmm. Because you could not say anything, anything at all adversely. You would be short of being attacked anywhere. And I've gone through times like this, the first war in the Gulf, uh, where even at a protest, even casually saying something. I mean, I, I was in situations where 
people tried to beat me up in the street over stuff like this. And so this was even more tense beyond my imagination. Um, and it, it's not been that long. And from that time of, um, you know, wanting revenge to now, to like, oh my God, I'm losing my children. I'm losing people, we're losing children everywhere. We're losing kids to, other people are losing kids to that how, you know, war is in the fabric of life. It means something. Maybe, maybe it doesn't affect everything, but oh my God, gas prices. You know, all of a sudden it's, you understand it in a concrete different way. Um, so around that time, that's what I was thinking. And when you wrote that? When I wrote that about war being even in the soap, at, just like economics are, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, in everything mm -hmm. that you do and touch and see, and that's a part of your life, but also this idea that I thought, you know, what does war mean? In, in our lives, you know, um, you cannot um, fight war with war. Mm -hmm. It will never work. You know, it just will never work. And I thought, and that's where this idea about, you know, singing to it, and she'll let me sing, that maybe, maybe this idea of what we think about control mm -hmm. and manipulation and being in charge and how we fight something, <clears throat> just like you can't, you know, extricate anger from you and cut it out like a cancer. Um, you can't extricate anger and violence like that. It's something that has to be approached in a different way. So, Okay. Um, I want to ask you the last question. We have a few minutes left. And it's a very simple question. And as you look back on all your experiences mm -hmm. as a writer, if you had to give advice Knowing what you know now, if, if you had to give advice to a, a young poet in their early 20s who's just starting out, um, what, what, what would that advice be? Love everything. Learn all the time. Never become a lifelong learner. Never stop learning. Be curious about everything, how it's taken apart, how it's put together, why it's where it is, what color is it, what it feels like when you touch it. I think um, <coughs> part of a poet is thinking like a scientist does, except we, we deal in the world of magic and, 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 and uh, expansiveness through metaphor in a different way. But we do need to understand the world in very similar ways because we think as human beings associatively. And I think that is the greatest asset a <coughs> poet can have and, and work all the time, right, every day. Work is, 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 is play. It's not just work, work. It's, uh, a writer writes, you need to write. Is there anything in your experience, I guess I'm trying to think if there's anything in your experience that you did that turned out a certain way that now, as, an, as a giver of advice, would mm -hmm. prompt you to say, like, say, don't do what I did, do this. I mean, when you think about your own trajectory. In um, other words, you know, some, 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 sometimes people say, well, this, is, this was my experience and these are some of the mistakes I made and I'm alerting, alerting you to them so that you don't repeat them. Any, anything in that area? Um, no, but one thing. There is no magical solution. So don't, don't look for it. Create your own. There is no perfect way mm -hmm. to figure out how to be a writer, a real working writer, and make a living and have a life that satisfies you in other ways and have a family or a relationship. Nobody's come up with the perfect recipe. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Don't spend time looking for it. That perfect recipe will be the one that you create, and it's different for everybody. So spend the time being very creative about how you put your life together to support your writing. Um, people have made all kinds of insane things work, and uh, that could be you as long as it works for you, mm -hmm. um, and it allows you to write. And don't don't get caught up in the world of publishing, right? For the love of writing. That if you couldn't share a poem with anybody, you'd still write, no matter what. That you That is your love and your joy to that extent where these things would fall away. That your ability to write and your dedication and commitment to your work never, never hinges on external approval from print. That's a good place to end this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. <laughs> <laughs>